Thank you, Lucas, and thank you, Klaus, for inviting me to give this talk today. This is a talk on redesigning legacy systems and what are the keys to success. And by success, I mean being able to deliver a product <clears throat> to production that is not laden with tech debt and um, satisfies business needs. All right. So this is going to be done as a set of keys. Um, it is geared towards redesigning legacy systems, but there are parts that could be used for regular greenfield development, but other parts will need a precursor. So this is not a time in Bloomberg talk. Uh, this is, um, as I said, drawing from my 30 plus years in uh, designing systems software, primarily in C++. Um, as Lucas said, I would like, <clears throat> if you have any questions, to include the slide numbers. They're in the bottom right-hand portion of the screen. And that just means at the end, it's very easy to navigate back to the slide and answer the question. So without further ado, do, let's get on. I have a lot to get through. So what is a legacy system? Well, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, a legacy system says denoting or relating to software or hardware that has been superseded but is difficult to replace because of its wide use. And I think that's a real good definition because if it's not hard to replace, we wouldn't really talk about it, it just gets done. But for the purposes of this talk, I want to make it even simpler, right? And that it's just the current software in production. Now, <clears throat> you might say, hold on, we just put software in a year ago or a year and a half ago, but any software that's currently in production, no matter how new, a legacy clock has started on it. So it will start suffering over time the same problems all legacy systems do. And if we talk about what a system, a system is defined as in terms of a system, it's almost self-referential, a system of intercommunicating components based on software forming part of a computer system. And this talk is geared towards the, I'm gonna say the lower end of a scale. So again, what is a system? it can be part of a larger system. So you can cut out a piece of a current system and use this on it and upgrade that part of the system. But for my mind, it's just a set of components that form part of a larger system. So it does not have to be the, you know, absolutely everything that's to do with some sort of transaction or whatever system you're working in. So the question does come up, what should we do, a full or partial re rewrite? And when we talk about a partial rewrite, I include ports in that um, definition. So the benefits of a partial rewrite are that you don't have to understand the whole system as long as you've done some analysis of the flow of data through the system or how the transactional processing might be done. You can just focus on that piece of the system. However, you will have to budget or allow time for making this part testable. And that's what I think is something that's forgotten when we do partial rewrites. You need to be able to test and you have to budget for that testing. And a lot of time that will involve writing the testing up front and then proceeding with your partial rewrite up board. Okay. Um, a full rewrite versus partial rewrite comes to a judgment call is the problem systemic or is it isolated to one particular piece? In other words, is there a problem with your database uh, handling? Is that the only thing that's that's wrong? If it's part of the whole system, you may need to start looking at a full rewrite. Either way, this can come from internally where you believe it should be rewritten and you campaign to your management and show some uh, facts of why this is the case. Or, you know, someone says to you, hey, this system is causing so much problems over here, it needs to be rewritten. All right, so however that comes about, you're told you have the green light to do a project rewrite. So we start with the project and we're, what was the first thing we're going to do? Well, we've looked at the current system. We say that, you know, it's got all kinds of problems. It's, uh, it's really bad and we can make this thing very much better and we have these loft, lofty goals we don't quite understand the problem but we do know that anything we could put in there is probably better than what's there so we don't define the problem very well and because of that we'll agree to unrealistic deadlines that means that hey we need this thing in i don't know nine months sure i'll give it you in nine months i have such a clear vision of what needs to be done um, and the next thing you're going to do is write a simple dev program. So something that's like a proof of concept, like a hello world, 
that duplicates some small part of the system or how you're going to have the larger system operate. I call this part of the timeline of a project sort of the honeymoon period because you're able to promise whatever you want. You're very enthusiastic. You think you can deliver everything that you completely understand the problem, which is unlikely, and that you can, you're a shoe in for getting a successful system in. But then we move on to the mid part of a project where I get real world trouble. And what I call for that real world trouble is where you're now having to take part of your simple dev proof of concept and make it work exactly like a part or maybe the whole of the real world system that you are replacing. This is when you find that, that the, the real world is not so clean lines, that your design gets under pressure to be broken because it's a lot of edge cases. There's a lot of arbitrary decisions that were made. And now you have to try and duplicate that behavior. Or you have to say the users have to get used to different behavior, which can be quite a lift. <clears throat> Next thing we have is scope creep. Because we haven't properly defined the problem in the beginning, and because we haven't seen here's what we're going to fix other than this is going to be better, and we've had a very simplistic view of what was going to happen, we are now going to get scope creep, both from the fact that you misestimated the complexity with edge cases and different workflows, so you now have to build that into your simple uh, initial demo, and outside where it's like, hey, you know what? Can we add maybe a little extra functionality because this is what the business users have been asking for a long while while we're at it. Either way, we expand the scope. And because we're in the middle of the timeline, we believe we still have plenty of time left to, to tackle these problems. But then we hit deadlines that get missed. Now, the deadlines that we miss, I hope, are not just the delivering the project that there has been intermediate deadlines. But if these deadlines are, I don't know, two or three months apart, there's very little resolution of when we know we missed them until we just run right up against them. And we don't know where we are as far as making these deadlines. And this will come back to not having the problem properly scoped and a chart of where we need to be along the timeline. So now we're into what I'll call the, the home, the, you know, the back run, the home stretch of the design and pushing out of this new development. And what happens is we're now under all kinds of pressure, management, business, we've missed some deadlines. So now we have to start hacking the design. We make compromises. And because of that, the design stops becoming clean. Do we, are we still putting testability in? Maybe that gets put to the side and we say things like, for now, we'll do this. It's like expedient just so we can get something out the door. Now, because we didn't properly define uh, deadlines and because we properly didn't give a scope of the problem and because we did not chart out all the intermediate milestones and deliverables on that, we are not sure where we are on our timeline. We may be close. We may be not. All as we know is we are, have a deadline and we haven't hit it. And then we come up, uh, we missed the deadlines again because we don't know where about between our two deadlines we are. And now we have to ask ourselves, what is up with the project? Is the project going to be given some extra lifeline? Do we strip functionality out? Do we deliver something that we know is buggy, but at least it's something out the door? And we have to ask ourselves, is the project now a failure? Or we sort of beg for mercy and we say, hey, can you put me back on, you know, give me a little more time. And because you give me a little more time, I'm going to go back to hacking the design. And I promise I'll deliver you something that's up to par and up to spec on what we need. This happens in a lot of projects. I've seen it personally, both in projects that I've joined and in other projects that I've seen from sister groups. We get into this cycle of, you know, we'll hack the design, hack the design. And in the end, we end up delivering something that is probably laden with tech debt and stripped down at functionality and really not considered a success. And the project may be actually abandoned at that time. So is there a way that we could approach these kind of problems and at least shift the balance more in our favor? It won't be a guarantee. It won't be a set of laws, but some guidelines that will make the probability of you know, uh, getting your project uh, launched properly. 
So I'm going to present this as a set of keys. And I think the first key you need is what ingredients are you going to need to get this thing done, right? It's like baking a cake. We need to know what we need to get the end product. So what do I think we need when we start a project? Well, I think we need a definition of success and some kind of way to prove that success. So is there a problem that will go away or a set of problems that will go away? And those problems should be sharply defined, not we'll make the system better, but we will get latencies down to here, or we have a problem where we have bottlenecks, these bottlenecks will go away, something like this. That is the best measure of success to have, and one that's easily visible to people who are not technical, like business or higher management. The other thing is if you don't have something like that, you can maybe lean on metrics and say some metrics will be realized. I guarantee we'll be able to do I don't know, 200 trades a second, or I'll be able to you know, render X frames a second, something like this. The problem with these metrics is they're usually poorly derived. Um, the wrong people derive them. And if you say, what's the metrics? And the technical guy says, well, we do 50 events a second. I'm going to get it up to 500. Do we really need 500? Is 500 realistic? Has this been pulled out of thin air? A lot of times that is the problem. It has been. And if I deliver a project and the end that says, hey, we do 150 a second, is that a failure? Because I did not hit 500. I would say probably not. The next thing you're going to need at the start of a project, I think, is knowledge composition. This can be also looked as members of a team or the knowledge you need to have, at least with the team or if it's just yourself. So you need some historical system knowledge. And the reason for having that is that we can disentangle the current system and provide context on little known tricks that were employed. And maybe you look at them and say, this is completely nonsensical. But if you get some background and context, you'll see that it is needed and you will have to fold that into any design you have. Uh, a philosopher, George Santanier, said that uh, those who cannot remember the past are stuck in it. And this is why you need historical system knowledge, so you don't repeat the same problems in the past. I also think you need design architectural experience because if you have it staffed, your team staffed, they're the only people coming in on this are people who are from the old system and have been there a long time. Well, I said those who cannot remember the past are damned to compete it, but those who are stuck in the past are also condemned to repeat it. It can be hard to see outside a system that you've been in a decade plus, right? Uh, new thinking can be hard to come across. So you need some design architectural experience. Usually that's someone who has a proven track record, is seasoned, has you know proven successful at this before. And I think you also need uh, a spot of new blood or creativity as if you have historical design architectural experience, which will you know so show some track record or seasoning, New ways of thinking about things are often brought in by you know, people who are new and they have novel perspectives. And although you might say, oh, doing something like this is ridiculous. However, the way you've presented it, let me think on it. And now we come up with something that is novel and you know, it, it helps, it helps. But what we want to do is create a vision of what we're going to have as the success and what are the initial components to try and get there. So this is, when we start so let's move on to the next oh and one thing as programmers we are low to think about because we like being technical and getting into design is you need business or market buy-in you need visibility so when you go through the rough patches you can apply leverage outside of your own rewrite right or it doesn't just get cancelled for no good reason so be visible have the business informed and have them excited about what you're going to deliver so next key, the key to requirements. How are we going to do this? We're going to analyze how data flows through the current system. This is something I think that's very neglected when we do legacy rewrites. We're so enamored with going ahead and designing a new system that we don't wonder what's actually going on in the old system. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough because you need to go and gather qualitative and quantitative intelligence on what are the peak loads in the system. What are the long latencies? Are these problems? What is your input composition? Is there certain types of input that cause the problem? 
um, what are the frequency of these inputs, right? And in the initial drive on a legacy system, this can be tough because a lot of times this means you have to go back and essentially add instrumentation to the legacy system to gather this data. Maybe there is no data on peak loads or latencies. There's only logs that say, you know, it went well or it didn't go well. And that can be tough, but you do need to build in um, time to go back and instrument the old system. Once you have this data, you can now look at it and reason about it, right? And to do that, you can then confirm what your intuition was and maybe uncover some misconceptions you had. You can see maybe uh, what I've pretty much always found on transactional systems is that the largest volumes are the simplest to replace. They are the simplest, so lots of people do it. Uh, you can then apply your own tests and measures of values and base your design on maybe what is going to happen when with this kind of data flowing through a system and again you can find the pain points right which is probably in the initial definition of what the problem is you're going to solve this gives you all the ammunition you need to hypothesize outcomes you can innovate and implement implement your design now map some strategic goals and I, I can't stress this enough. I think it is the most underused design asset in a legacy system rewrite. If it's a brand new system, you have to take a shot, guess, or look at another system that's out there and base your design on what you think is going to happen. But here in a legacy rewrite, we can base the design on the data evidence. And that is so key to solving the right problems and not trying to solve non-problems that you just think are problems because I don't know, that's just maybe a bias you have. So what's the next thing? We have to do the system design. Now that we have the data, we've seen where choke points, where problems are, we can now define the problem. We should produce a design. But the problem with a lot of design is we say we want to use a lot of implementation technologies up front, and now let me figure out the design. I have gone to many meetings on design proposal and it's a list of buzzwords and how we're going to integrate them and the actual design of how they fit together is secondary, which I think is the car before the horse. So you produce your design first. Design, I think, is technology agnostic to a large degree. If I need a database, most any database can probably be worked into a design. As long as I have a place, that, that's where I'm going to persist the data. Same with communication. As long as I have point to point, I can route, I don't know, requests. As long as I have some sort of broadcast, I can send it to, I don't know, consoles or displays. The inclination is to believe technology will solve systemic problems. And by that, I mean problems with the way the system is currently architected. In the old days, you could say my system is slow, and if it was computation-based, I'm just waiting for a faster CPU to come on the market. These days, we've kind of hit that uh, Moore's law, so we don't have that particular uh, you know, crutch to lean on anymore. And threading is difficult. Paralleling is difficult, and we have to design for that. And then the last point that I think you need to take a careful look at is that you're not mimicking the existing design with new technologies. And that's a big danger if it's people that are solely worked on the old system are coming up with the new system. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you an architecture here that uh, is very close to stuff I've seen uh, a lot, where we have something coming in from the outside. Here, it's the, the fix is coming in. So that's something we can't change. And we have some kind of preprocessor. This preprocessing task is going to take that data, essentially just put it into our own data format and send it on to the next task in the line, which is enrichment. Enrichment will reach out for all kind of uh, data to supplement the request, the referential data based on what's in the request. Once that's done, it goes on to core handling, which manipulates the state, supplies transaction, does the core work. That is then persisted to a database. And then we broadcast this to the set of users so they can follow that transaction on their screens or in their application, whatever. So as you can see, this is very linear, very serial, and is, you know, let's say this thing has been having problems. And someone comes up with this as the design solution. So what have we actually done here? Let me just go back. So here's the old one. Here's the new one. 
And really all that we're doing here is replacing one technology with another. We are not doing anything as far as the data flows through the system. Okay, I'm using MQ now instead of some sort of TCP process I was using before, or TC, TCP API I was using before. I'm using Cassandra instead of some Sybase, Cassandra, you know, no SQL, very exciting. Lots of people talking about it. Uh, I use Kafka for distribution. Well, that's great, except for uh, what am I getting by replacing Kafka with Tib? I may be getting some side benefits, but am I really solving any problem in that system? I would say you're probably not. And, you know, putting new in front of processes, I have a real problem with because it's new to you and it's new now, but 10 years down the road, you won't see, uh, no one will see this as new. So even if you're writing it from legacy to modern C++, that's just a language change. That is not an architectural change of what you're doing. So you really are doing a port here, which like I say, if it's one part of your system that's causing the problem, maybe your TCP is a throughput issue, then MQ has a faster throughput, it, it works maybe. But did you look at the data flowing through the system and ensure that's the case before you came up with this architecture? So again, don't mimic the legacy system. And things to keep in mind are underlying technology replacement is usually not the answer for systemic problems. And while using the latest technology is nice, it should be at the end, not at the start of the design process, okay? Now, one thing I will shake my head over is unfortunately buzzwords, unrealistic expectations, promising the moon are the norm, especially in presentations to get a uh, process off the ground or rewrite off the ground. It wins approval and you've won approval at the expense of probably having a project failure, which is why we have such dismal uh, statistics in our industry for delivering projects, you know, on budget, on time to spec. That's a rare kind of thing we do these days. So anyhow, uh, moving on. So now I have a design, and I can see there's pieces of this design I'll have to I'll have to come up with. But I want to know how long is this journey going to be? And the only way I can do that is put down markers in the sand, which I call deliverables or milestones, to tell me where am I on my timeline. So let me get a definition out first. A deliverable is a measurable or tangible outcome of the project. I can say, look, here's a demo. I can show you, you can see it, you can hear it. It's something that's not theoretical. Uh, milestones are checkpoints throughout the life of the project. They identify where we've hit some kind of notable point. In other words, all of this has been converted over. Are this now piece of the old project is retired? This is completely replaced with the new piece. And then we have tasks and tasks are really important because this is going to give you the resolution of how you're going to be able to look at the um, how far along you are on getting your product to, out to production so they should be attainable and realistic in other words they should be something that you can actually do you can actually see it and it's going to be easy to demonstrate it observable right that's a deliver so let's have some deliverables where you can show what's been done additional functionality look at the load i have extra load going here the characteristics are a lot better than the old system charitable so for that i mean the resolution on these are low so they come down to three to five uh, days for any particular task if you just say i'm giving you this product in nine months i can probably guarantee you that's probably not going to happen and I won't know till the very end that it's not going to happen. If I have all these deliverables and milestones charting my way through getting from the start of the project to the end of the project, I can say I am halfway to the project and maybe 70% of my time is gone. I can now inform the stakeholders of this project. This project is not going to come along in the next two months. I'm actually gonna need five. But telling them beforehand and a lot beforehand is a lot better than telling them a week or the day of that I've blown my timelines. So again, having them chartable allows you to forecast better and keep your stakeholders apprised of where you are. And if I would say one thing about this is that this allows you to look at 
functionality or your code metrics and say where you are along the timeline, right? I always say to, say to people, it's functionality, code metrics over feelings. It's it's not original to me. I heard it someplace else. But I lots of time people say, oh, I think things are going really well. I, I feel they're going well. Okay, pull me out your timeline, show me all your deliverables and where we are in time and functionality. Now I have a lot better confidence that you're telling me what's actually going on. So moving forwards, uh, how do we keep this stuff? So we now have a design, we've charted deliverables, people are out there coding, All right? What are we gonna to do to try and stop the same thing happening in our code base? Well, we want code quality. And as someone said to me, quality is the result of consistent incremental improvement. So we know what we're trying to do with our deliverables and our milestones. How are we gonna get there? Well, let's have some quality in our code. So we have to realize it, right, realize that iteration will, you know, get to where we need to go in a saner manner than trying to do everything up front, completely define the scope up front. And by define the scope, I mean of anything that could happen, right? So we've defined the scope of what we're solving, but how we're going to go about it, how far-fetched the scenario are we going to look at? Well. The data should show you where the scenarios are you're dealing with and far-fetched ones should be left there. The, the other problem is um, we will get some scope creep and that can happen again because we have, uh, we have misunderstood the complexity of the problem, but it also comes uh, um, in when we're doing the code and the development where we say, hey, I'm gonna write this class or I'm gonna write this function and it's gonna handle what we need it to handle. But you know why? Down the road, we're going to have to handle X, Y, and Z as well. So let me take this thing and make it, I don't know, templatize it or make it a whole lot more configuration driven. Soaks up time, soaks up extra testing, and you've just let your scope creep. So your timelines are now in jeopardy again. So resist scope creep. Small tasks that overflow the time boundaries it just means that you misestimated its complexity here. I thought this would take three days, but after three days, we're only a tiny way in. We'll then make it a spike and break it up into multiple tasks that can be dependent on each other. The real world is messy. I say this a lot when I'm talking to people about design. The real world does not follow clean lines, does not live in a lab. So you have to struggle to adhere to design goals and your overall vision. When the real world gives you something that's difficult to incorporate into your design, struggle to incorporate it, take time. It can be difficult, but there's usually a way. However, if you find out that there is no way, you've talked to people, you've done the test, and I say the design has a terminal match with reality, then you must evolve the design. The design needs to change. Holding to an ideal or a paradigm um, when the real world says you can't is a problem. You need to be more flexible. And I was in a project where we had this exact problem, the whole, uh, design was based on having sort of tiers that could look down, but no one could ever look back up. A really nice concept. I was actually in the driver's seat where I showed that I had to break that particular um, paradigm and it was met with a lot of resistance. Um, but once I proved that it needed to happen, people were like, can we hide the dependency? Because we had some checkers that would check that you aren't looking back up. and you know by using void pointers or you know type erasure and i think that's just the wrong way to go i actually managed to convince the um the, the people in the project that was the wrong way to go and we added this back in and it turned out to open a whole new vista of problem solving that was you know people had been struggling against in other parts of the project but when you are moving forward, do not make the same mistake that is likely done with the legacy through lack of testing. You must maintain code quality through testing, whether it be unit or system testing. Nothing should go get through a review without a unit test testing that change or testing that new piece of functionality. You should also look for system testing. Unit testing is not the be all and end all. It's great, but it by definition, just checks a very remote, simple part of the system that's isolated from everything else. When you put everything together, new problems arise. 
So budget for it and make sure it happens. Don't come back and say, now we have to add the testing in. So given that iteration is the key, how do we identify these loops that are critical to hitting these target dates? Well, what are the iterative feedback loops? I think they, there are more, and in the expanded version of this talk I gave at ACCU, I talk a bit deeper into it, but I look at it as unit testing, you know, runs immediately, gives you feedback in minutes. Automated system integration testing, you know, that's maybe 15 minutes, half an hour. Code reviews, hopefully we'll catch stuff, but it takes a day, maybe two days when you're making changes to catch it there. QA will depend on your schedule and if you have a separate QA group. Uh, mine is, I think, a weekly or bi-weekly schedule. And then alarms are happening whenever they happen in production usage. Well, that can be days, weeks, or months down the road. But when it happens, it's usually unpleasant and there's a huge uncomfortable feeling of urgency and responsibility. So if any of these are left out, so I decide, you know what? Automated integration testing is now a priority for me. And where is my problems going to migrate up to? Well, they're probably going to migrate up to QA, meaning it's now a week before you're told that the problem is there. Maybe another week to fix it, and a week for you to for a week for them to check it's fixed. Now we've just had a three-week problem, right? We've now ballooned out our iterative loop and killed the productivity. If it was pushed back into integrating testing, we would have got it in 15 minutes. And that is another thing. If a QA or automated testing or God forbid production uh, finds a problem, we should try and push the test for that problem as far, you know, as far down this loop from production. Well, actually, it would be up here. So try to push it to QA. So QA test for it. Try and push it into your integration testing. And if possible, is there a unit test that would catch this? If there is magic, I don't want to say, well, QA caught the problem. So my whole testing system is fine, it's complete, it's not. You wanna catch them early. So catching earlier is what gives you productivity. So you also have to ask, are the tests in the right iteration group, which is the shortest turnaround? Observability or understanding system health. When I put this thing out in production, how good is this system gonna be reacting to the normal day-to-day -day operation or loads that's on it? I don't know. My responsibility doesn't end by pushing it into production. If it's buggy, if it's a lot of tech debt, if it doesn't perform a particular task very well, well, then that's a problem. So what I want to build in is some observability. And that means I want to alarm on bad hours. Bad hours are surprisingly hard to uh, nail down. So what is a bad hour? A bad hour is not when the user cannot do something. So I, I, I don't know. I try to withdraw 100 dollars out of my bank account but i only have 50 and i get error you don't have enough money that's not a system error that is proper behavior successful handling of the interaction intentions not met are bad and error i mean if i actually gave 100 bucks out in my system when i only had 50 in it that would be undesirable outcome and it's not due to the user the user is free to do whatever he wants to do right the other thing we're pretty good at is checking if processes are down or if it's you know doing multiple restarts or even if the, if it has if it's frozen we might have some heartbeat processes that could check to make sure if a process is up and not doing anything we get told before people you know our customers start telling us or that the depend dependencies are unavailable so uh, i don't know i can't access something off the network but the other kind of alarms which i think we are much need much more improvement on is using metrics and the meaningful metrics uh, cresting watermarks. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I have uh, events coming through a system and I'm having to retries to get some resource, it eventually comes comes to me, but it's happening every so often and slowing down my time. I should have alarms and stuff like this. If my latency over a particular time goes up above X, I should know about it, right? I don't want customers complaining to me, hey, the system is slow. I want to get ahead of it. Uh, other thing is where resources are being consumed. Uh, you know, my processor uh, usage has gone above 80%. My queue size is utilized over 80%. Um, if this is not normal, this is new, well, then something has probably gone rogue and I should get to it and kill it as soon as possible as opposed to letting it get to 100% and taking the whole system down. 
And people ask me, putting in these kind of metrics, is it applicable to a smaller rewrites? I say, yes, it is. Otherwise, how do you know how a system is doing? Eyes on glass or having someone in front of your metrics and looking at the dashboard is usually a poor way of catching a problem because someone won't be there at the right time to look at this. So you should have observability built in uh, these days. I think where in the old days we used to say you could skip uh, unit testing. We didn't really need it. Now we know we do. I think uh, metrics is in the same kind of boat these days where there's still a resistance to putting in the time, but we will down the road realize it's very important to have them. And then quickly, I see we're burning up time here, moving new users. So when I go to roll this thing out, how am I going to use it? So especially if it's part of a system, am I going to move the new users by functionality? There's what they're doing or by who they are. And the big thing you have to ask here is where will the tail, and by that I mean the last people who are going to be uh, converted over to your new system, and who will be on it? If you partition by function, you will generally pull in large multi-method clients sooner and see large benefits realized. Um, and that's going to be a big win when you show business, when you show management, and that's going to allow you to get more resources and more time to take these other more difficult problems on board and drag them in because you've proved to be a success. If you partition by client, you generally will move the low volume. And I struggle to find a world here unimportant, but I mean that these are people whose business doesn't contribute a lot to what you're doing. So they're very limited. And because of that, you can move them over to your new system because they don't do very diverse things. But that means that the large clients will move at the very end. And I've seen this happen numerous times in a project. And as one business analyst, analyst told me, no one is celebrating moving an important client to a redesigned product five years after it was first rolled out. There's almost a, a grunt of pain and sort of we want to forget about this whole experience. And one other thing I think to help people move over is if you have identified problems and you may actually identified some functionality that's easy to add in, don't backport these benefits to the old system so people have a reason to move. I have also seen when a system's been redone, someone go, hey, you know, this is great, but you're going to deliver it in six months. Can we not just take a month out and add it to the old system? Because this is our users have been begging for this for, for the longest time. And it's like, well, no, it's not going to take a month to put this thing in. It's probably There's no analysis of the system. And now I've given you just a reason to stay with your old system. You've upgraded it and taken some of the flash of what I'm doing. So if we follow these um, points, maybe we can get on to a new type of uh, timeline where the first thing we do is we find the problem. We find, because we find the problem, we can define the scope. We look at the data. The data will show us how the problems are manifesting in the system. And, and we can think about how we're going to um, design around that. So we'll have a de database design. Because we have this design, we can start talking about realistic deadlines. And not only realistic deadlines, but charting our progress, at least a line, a, a timeline that says, here are all the pieces that are going to be done. Now, you won't know all these at the start. I get that. But as things crop up, you can punch them in there and say, is this expanding the scope? Can we leave it to another phase? If not, let me put it in here and see if it moves the guidelines around. And when someone says, where are you on this project? You can pull it out and say, I am, here's A and B, and I am point X here. And here's what I think about getting the rest of this thing done. <clears throat> Again, you have a data-driven design. It should be solving the problems. And because it's data-driven and solving the problems, I think the real world app adaptation should be less than if you just go in there blind. And you're going to be resisting scope creep because, again, you have a defined scope of this problem. And you're just making the real world adaptation for your defined scope. Uh, you always have to resist scope creep. Uh, as a developer, you may want to make the system fancier or drag in a new technology and think this will make things really cool. But can you get away with using some of the same technology in your new design? I would say lots of times the answer is yes. 
So we have milestones that are targeted. Because we are on that timeline, we should hit the milestones. I'll be able to give people plenty of advance notice that we are missing this milestone and it's way down the road, but it looks doubtful. It's probably going to push out. And because our resolution is so fine, we can get down to a finer resolution. Uh, we keep on adapting the design, all right? Real world is messy. There will be edge cases we haven't looked at. Uh, do we have to handle those? We keep adapting design. And if there's a terminal mismatch with reality, we evolve. Is the progress on track? I have a timeline. I have all this, these markers on it. I can tell you if I'm on track. And then hopefully I execute a rollout. And part of the milestone should have been a rollout plan and a rollout schedule. So. Uh, you should be able to execute at least a, a rollout that's um, thought out as opposed to, I've just made all my design, now let me figure out how I'm going to roll it out. And then you get to ask yourself, am I a success? Not if I'm a success, but am I a failure, right? <laughs> it's not a failure anymore. It's how successful am I and how how is the quality of this thing because of the testing, because of the structured nature of attacking this problem, we should have something that is... Uh, reliable, and less tech debt, and successful. So now I'm going to turn it over to some questions. Um, that is what I will call the theory part. So Lucas, if there is any questions, um, all ears. Yes, there are many questions. Um, all right, let's start with the first one by Klaus. Um, it's not, I think, specific to a slide. He asks, in the definition of legacy, you did not explicitly mention tests. Was this intentional? Do you think tests play a part in defining legacy systems? I think you kind of answered this. Yeah, I think when I talked about partial versus full rewrites, a full rewrite, which is what we're talking about here, I've made many mention of the system testing and unit testing and how that drives up your code quality. I think if you're doing a partial rewrite, you are sometimes led to believe that you only have to modify a small part of the system and it's really qu quick and cheap, but you forget to factor in the testing. You need to add testing. And if it's a legacy system with zero testing involved currently, that can be a challenge. And I've had that happen where I've come on a legacy system, I've been given some moderate size change to do, and I've built in the testing to my timelines. Um, and at the end, I have something that's testable and I sleep well at night. But when I say to other people in the team, you need to put testing into your changes as well. It's like, well, what you had just turned out to be testable. And what I have is just inherently untestable. And that's not, I worked hard to make it testable and so should you. Just as a small follow-up question there, when you talk about testing, I assume you're you mean automated testing because presumably someone somehow tested the thing they were they wrote right. the I am in a way that's not yeah. unit testing and system testing. I'm not talking about a user uh, manually doing this because that's very labor intensive, very risky, and usually you'll get incompleteness from the consistency won't be the same from one person to another. Okay. So let's move on to uh, Roy. He has a question for slide seven. Do you remember for legacy upgrade project should have a milestone of same functionality as the legacy system using the new code base or should the new system uh, capabilities? So here's slide seven. Um, could you repeat that question again? I'll paraphrase a bit. Um, mm -hmm. He's asking about uh, scope creep and feature adding. Uh, some people in chat also mentioned they find it difficult to get uh, refactors uh, greenlit by management if they don't promise new features developed in parallel. So like, should you add new features while you're refactoring or should you somehow separate them? You I hope I understood try, your question. You should try as much as humanly possible to resist that. You can say, look, once I get done with this phase of duplicating, the very next phase will be adding this extra functionality in. Um, it can appear that you can just add it in, but that's the kind of scope creep that will kill your your your, your timeline. That's the kind of thing that will make you, you know, become at the end. I have a whole lo load of stuff that doesn't work, as opposed to a defined set that does. And I think creating phases of updates to a project is a way to convince management that 
it's not that bad. I'm going to give you exactly this in this timeline. And then, you know, for the next two months, I'll work on this new feature. I said, otherwise, I'll have to say it's an eight month project, but why would you want to dilute your deliverables? Right. So that's how I, I, I've handled it in the past. So like feature parity is a concrete deliverable that should be communicated to management. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be feature parity. There will be other stakeholders. And I've oftentimes found that there is large blocks of code that are dead in there that potentially you could put something down and you nail down. It all comes down to what is the problem? And if they say, well, what about this stuff over here? And you go, that's not part of the problem, right? Uh, I'll give you the problem solved in the area that it's manifesting. Right. So I so feature parity to me doesn't really come into it because yes, the system will have to work a lot of times the same way as before, but it does not have to work exactly like before. It has to solve the problem in a way that the stakeholders agree to. And that doesn't mean doing the same bad things to give the same bad parity, if you want to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. But I like one last question here, uh follow up. But that assumes knowing what the stakeholders want. Okay, so if you don't have the stakeholders involved in this process, that's why we have a lot of failures. In other words, I think I know what you need. I think I know what your problems are. Um, let me just go off and do what I think. And then I solve non-problems and enhance something you don't care about, right? The stakeholders have to be involved. It's, it's a pain, but you need to involve them as far as defining the problem, right? In other words, here's the problem here's my proposed solution to the problem. Here's the data that backs all this up. Are you comfortable with this? And here's the timeline. And if business goes, okay, great. If they push back, then it becomes a negotiation, right? Time, quality, and feature set, right? Quality, I don't think is one of the negotiables. So it's time and feature set is what you're going to debate about. Mm -hmm. Then, um... Uh, ben Rian asks for slide 15. Okay. It, like, that's essentially don't do a Nicola. Like, it's more of a statement, I think. Um, I'm not even sure who, who's mentioned, who's meant with that. Now that I read it again, it doesn't even seem like a question. So uh, maybe let's just move on. Okay. Um, unless you know, you, you see it as a, like a conversation starter. I'm not sure. Maybe it's better for the after talk chat. My bad. I, that the slide number made me assume it's a question. Okay. Um, there's, is there many more questions? Because we are burning time. I do want to get to what people, when I have given this talk before, people are very interested in the actual application uh, of this to a real world project. And I, I don't want to sell that short. So how about we table the questions till the end? And I move on with the next piece, which is a case study in using these. Now, again, this comes from one of the uh, I, I worked it out. I think I've been on 15 different projects in, I don't know, 12 or 13 companies because I was a consultant for 21 years, um, roughly a two-year tenure in each place. But it allows me to see a wide variety of what's used and what's done in various places. So let's move on. And let's talk about a case study. So I've fudge some of the names and that to protect the innocent and the guilty. And I'll call this project Pilar. So a brief history about this project was that we had this system that received uh, trades, it enriched and processed them, and then determined whether these trades could proceed down to settlement, all right? Uh, which means like the broker and the dealer actually transferred the money. Uh, a project rewrite was, init was initiated when the legacy system was taken 30 minutes for these trades to process at market close. So when the market close, uh, up to the market close, people hang back and then they just publish a whole bunch of trades so people can't sort of react to their trades. And this causes a big, a big pulse of activity around four o'clock. So it was taken 30 minutes for these trades to be processed. We got multiple complaints and tickets from clients saying that, hey, you know, it took 30 minutes today. This is really, you know, unacceptable. And it would be like, okay, the Pilar system is in development. But what did in development actually mean? In this case, it just meant that a couple of engineers were given the problem to solve and they had no plan. 
There was no completion dates. No real definition of the problem other than, yeah, the 30 minutes is a problem. And it was going nowhere. It really was aimless. And I think not only do you have to deal with the fact that the project is going nowhere, but the people on the project kind of disillusioned, right? You're not very enthusiastic or up for something when you don't really know where you're going or what you're trying to accomplish. So uh, although I used most of the steps here, I have to say this was before I sort of formalized these steps down into a set of keys, but I seem to follow them sort of by instinct anyhow. So uh, let's continue. So what was the key ingredients from things we'll need? Well, I needed a definition of success. And for that, there was, is there a problem that will go away when this rolls out? And, it, and it's yes, these 30 minute delays that are happening at market close will go away. Uh, that was a very broad statement, and I can really not make too much more of a statement on that until I get in and look at the data flow, which is going to come later. What about the team composition? Well, initially, the team had a long-time legacy system maintainer. I think he was there 13, 14 years. So he knew the legacy system pretty intimately and had... Um, you know, done a lot of the code changes and knew a lot of the reasons of why there was some very strange code. Others, some were defendable and others were not, right? I had a brand new guy. Uh, I was in there less than a year, but uh, that's my new blood. Uh, I got my historical. And then there was a guy, a middling programmer is not talking about his ability. It's talking about his tenure. So he was there about three plus years. And then there was myself. Um, I think I was there about two years at the time when I did this, though I can't be quite sure. And um, to me, I had a lot of what I needed. I had the historical knowledge with the, the legacy and the three plus years guy. The new guy added a lot of, hey, what about these technologies? Or what about this? And myself, I thought I supplied a lot of the architectural design experience that was needed. But uh, And I was running the project uh, as well. So key to requirements, analyzing the data flows through the system. Now, I was lucky in that I did not have to go back and instrument the legacy code because many moons ago before this, there had been an imperative um, push down from higher up management that all these type of uh, numbers and data of what flow, flow through the system had to be put in a central repository that everybody could quiz. So I already had the data there to look at. However, no one, well, I can't say no one. I don't know of anyone who really went there and looked up the data profile of what was going through the systems to see where is the problems, where is the volumes. But that was the first place I went to. And when I looked at the trades that were uh, bottling up the system at, uh, at market close, I found that they came from two sources primarily. There were three sources of this data. But two sources were causing the bottleneck. One was direct from clients who were sending us their trades all in one big lump. And other was from an order management system that was internal. And again, they people using that system would just send the trades along, you know, close to market close. So now I have some grasp on the split of where the data is coming from. There was a third set of data, which was a direct application. And that was seen as the most important of these. When I started looking at the composition of the trades, all right, I found out that, and here's the data. Again, I was able to pull this data out. The trade composition where I have to anonymize this, again, to protect copyrights and stuff. But there was a type A trade that was 90% of the volume. And it was a type C that was 5.25%. And then there was a whole bunch of other types that were under 5% of the system, right? Now... I don't know, but I'm going to suspect that this at this time that type A is the, is the simplest transaction tra uh, transaction to do, and the MISC are a bunch of very very tricky edge case complicated uh, trades. So when I looked at the direct trades from clients, I found that the top user accounted for 78 percent of those trades, and the top four users accounted for 85 percent of those trades. So what does that mean? That means that I have to get on board relatively few users of the simpler trade to take a huge part of this volume. Um, I also have a decision about whether I'm going to pull down direct from clients and from OMS, or I'm just going to go after one. And again, to limit the scope creep of this, 
I, I pitched it that I am going to take care of the 53% in phase one and the 38% in phase two. Now, if I can prove I can deliver phase one, people are going to be pretty happy to know that I'm delivering phase two. So let's go. So I so again, I omitted the OMS trades to limit the scope. So let me just show you what the legacy system architecture looked like. You can see that it's pretty serial. We have a pre-process step. We have an enrichment step. We have a core handling state step. It's going to give you um, the persistence and then we're going to broadcast so everybody can keep abreast of what's going on with the trades and the response that goes back over here over this loop here goes back and out to the original uh requester it says hey we did it or we didn't or there's an error whatever so as you can see it's very linear and it's very serial so again looking at the latency analysis of what was going on here this was not as easy to get my hands on i had to go and do a little instrumentation to see what latencies were like i seen that the latency was in the enrichment phase so it was very quick to convert the external data type into the internal data type it was very quick to do the uh, state transition changes once everything but the referential data was where things were lagging and all the operations done in there, and there were many, there was one to end type of uh, enhancements, right? Uh, user permissions, uh, security data, uh, uh, trade, uh, trade delegation responsibilities. There's a whole bunch of stuff that was going on in there in a single thread. And one of the problems with the system when I looked into it was that any hang up in any of these parts of the enrichment, which reached out to external systems, would freeze the system up. And when I looked, that's what I found was happening. By looking at the data, I was like, freeze ups will be hap is happening here. And I looked, there were tickets about freeze up, which I hadn't been told about originally. When I looked at the peak time analysis, the, I seen that the throughput also lagged due to what I'll call stampeding volumes or throttling. So what was happening was, like I said, there was three sources of data. So source C was seen as the you know, the direct premium thing that had to be kept free. And it had a timeout of a minute. And at four o'clock when the system was lagging out, it lagged over a minute. So this thing would uh, come back as an error. And that was seen as something we don't want on our source C system. So the other two systems were put on a throttle and they weren't put in any kind of variant throttle. They were put on a throttle that was there all day, every day, no matter how busy or how light it was. This is we're going to allow it to do only X number of trades a second. So that was also something that I was surprised when I looked in uh, and analyzed the data. And then I also found there was a secondary problem of because the, there was such lag that duplicate trades would be sent to the system. Right? I send a trade. I don't get a response within a minute. Let me send another trade in. You know, if I'm on a system, I'm mashing the button saying, where the hell is my trade? But that was due to lags. They would get rejected, but they were still load on the system. So I came across a last snag, and this was something where there was some attribute inside of a trade that said that this thing could possibly need manual intervention. <clears throat> and that was a system that was far away from where I, had, where I was. I had no pull, no ability to get them to make a change. And they were in what I will call the older part of the group and more settled in their ways and not willing to do the change. So again, data analysis to the rescue. So we had uh, this data pulled it out. Of all the trades for a month, how many of these trades I'm looking at are manual? And I found that it was 2.48%. You can see the actual numbers up here. Now, when I backtracked these 2.48%, I could found out, as I suspected, manual trades, a high volume user is not going to want manual intervention. None of the high volume users did manual trades. So it was for small, small time, very low trade users that probably have been there a long time. But I was able to exclude them from the scope of the project. All of a sudden, this snag goes away, doesn't affect my timelines, and it kills an external dependency that I'm pretty sure would have killed me. So in summary, the simplest trades have the largest volume and the few, fewest clients. So I have 
targeted my win. I have now, I can now go back and say, here's the problem scope. Here's what I'm going to fix. Here's the problems in your system. And now I have a very defined scope. If you try and change the scope, I'm not going to let you. That's the first one. And if I'm absolutely forced to, it's going to involve some sort of time change. Right. Next, designing. So now I have all this data. What about the design? Well, what happened with the original approach was that it was uh, legacy guys, I'm going to say, that were driving the design, right? It was serial in nature, and you know the, there was proven problems with it. Thinking that writing it in modern C++ or putting in a new database, which is, I'll, I'll just pop it up here, right? It's still very serial. It still doesn't, uh, uh, address the enrichment problem which is where a lot of the problems are it says hey you know what we're going to use some fancy new database stash distribution where the distribution is handled as part of the database so you subscribe to something it prevent it provides this api provides persistence and distribution and it's new so it's got to be great so that's going to solve our, all our problems that's right no it won't this is i'm almost 100 we didn't they, they had gone down this Particular path. And what they had done is they had actually taken the old enrichment process and just ported it over and sort of bolted on some uh, data mutation and transportation between the process and the core handling, right? And even the pre process had a lot of cut and pasted code from the original pre processor. All a mistake and all easily done if you are trapped in a that glass box of how this system has worked and you haven't seen or you know, maybe you're not the creative guy. I don't know. So I came along and I, after looking at it, said, hey, we need to address the problems. And my problems are the enrichment process mainly. The other problems is uh, the lag that happens between the user entering a trade and seeing it on the application. So how am I going to uh, address these problems? Well, first, I'm going to move away from a serial nature. I'm going to use a hub and spoke model. And what that means is that when stuff comes in on the, when when requests come in here on the fix, I'm going to pre-process. This is going to be a brand new piece of code. The old piece is thrown out, completely scrapped, and we tightly define what we're going to have this pre-processor do because it's not going to handle everything like the old system done. It's going to handle the stuff that we've targeted. Once it comes into this new database distribution point, the the, the hub here, what happens is all the other uh, referen reference uh, enhancers, the external keys, reference data, permission, user data, they're all going to concurrently just get this thing and start working on enhancing. Once they enhance it, they're going to put it back in. Eventually, when all the enhancements are done, it would go out here. I still am going to have a lot of lag because if every enhancement has to work, then what happens when one ties up? So again, we address that by a request when it comes in through the preprocessor went directly out this way. So you had a trade show up in the front end with, with very little, refer, no referential data on it. So let's say the referential data um, finishes. Then that part, that goes back in here and comes out. So now the application is updated with whatever data it supplied. Same with external keys. Now this would normally happen so fast the user does not see multiple updates it's just there but in the case of i don't know uh, some of the external keys are taking a long time or is hung up you still get all the other data showing up in the app it won't show up that you can send it to settlement but at least it's all there and that uh, that uh, addressed that problem of that serial nature and the other thing is in the old system the i believe one of the longest enhancement enrichments was at the very back of the serial queue of enhancements. Right here, they all go on um, in parallel. The other thing is that the enrichers themselves, so all these block here can have multiple instances brought up. So you can bring up more uh, if you think that that's what's needed. In my case, it wasn't, but it, it, the, the system was built to do that. So again, going back, Use a real new design. We based it on the, the data flow through the system we've seen. So we targeted that the dependencies are lessened and they're parallel. 
uh, it's scalable. I can add more stuff in. And the technologies are an afterthought, right? It really doesn't matter what I have in there. It so happened it fit in nicely with one of the core technologies that were being pushed, which was this persistence and distribution API. And it just worked in well with the model that was there. But I could easily, I think, have had a Sybase and some uh, process that was a central manager of, of, of the data. But I didn't have to do that, and that was great. But my point here is the design was based on data, not intuition. So we tackled real world problems based on that. And that was so useful. I just can't tell you how frustrated it makes me see other projects ignoring this. And in fact, a project I was on not that long ago um, was going down this path. And I campaigned and might have said complained bitterly about the fact we did not have uh, proper analysis of the data going through the legacy system. They did that. And then what we found out is that, look, um, a huge amount of the volume was very simple to push through it, but they're part of multi-method clients who have these large clients also have very small amounts of trades that are very complicated. What are we going to do? Well, we'll talk about that a little later, but the data, it's just so key to have it. Now, we talked about deliverables and we know stage. I have to travel a road. Where am I on that road? Well, what I say is let's get the milestones out. So I had a set of milestones and this were to replace the legacy task copies with brand new code or, and brand new design starting at the input data. So in other words, we want to say the first one that goes in there is something that goes through. No enrichment comes out the back, uh, the back of it and shows up on the thing. That was number one. But I want to replace all of those things piece by piece. And my deliverable is going to be raw, unenriched trades showing up in the app. So that's phase one. The next thing is a bunch of milestones, which adds each of these enrichments. So now that I have an unenriched trade showing up in my, in my front end, I now add each of those enrichers you've seen on the spokes. As I add each enrich enricher, I can demonstrate in the front end that here's the security data been added. Here's the permissions been added. Here's like the, because you could only see them as, uh, you know, the trader who put the trade in first. But now what happens is, the permissions come in and all his delegates can now see it. So I can just show that on the front end. And that's going to show the progress to people, real people that are not so technical when I say, hey, you got a load of stuff on here on my code base. If you knew what was going on, you'd be really impressed. The next set of milestones once we had this, once we had this system there was the automation of various tests. Now, the previous piece, by the way, of adding these enrichers and stuff, this all came with unit testing. No PR went through without unit tests being attached to it. And if you tried, you were kicked back. And even though I was leading that project, I would be kicked back and actually be kicked me back on something else. I had trained them, I thought too well, but they were right. Uh, I was trying to cut a corner and I shouldn't have. Uh, so the next thing was QA automation. So this is like your system level end-to-end -end tests. As it turned out, we were told we have no QA resources. There's none to be given. So we actually budgeted part of the project to talk to the QA group, look at their test suite, and then automate it. We automated it in Python. And because we automated that test, we didn't need a week to pass for QA to look at these tests and, and perform them. We performed them on demand. And in fact, what happened was they were attached to our PR system. All right, anytime you did a PR, this testing had to work as well, or it wouldn't get promoted to the next stage to beta. And it had to work in beta, or it wouldn't get promoted to the first stage of production, and on and on. And another deliverable, which I think we kind of maybe don't have, is an accepted rollout plan, plan, plan for prod. This thing can't just be pulled out willy-nilly and saying, here, we'll just throw it in at the end. What is your rollout plan? Who's going to get on it? Who's going to be first? And then the, the next deliverable is the actual code rollout and the, the timetable for turning clients on if you're not going to put them all on at the same time. So this game was a very, very well defined. Now, inside each of these were sprints of, go, of, of tasks. And these tasks gave us either we misestimated the complexity. So this thing broke out into two or three tasks, in which case, how does that affect our deliverables? Right? Or we were able to absorb it, or it's something we're already taking care of. Great. 
So moving forwards, iterative adaptive improvement and code quality. So we had frequent design reviews. I always called them cutthroat, um, especially new tasks and refactors because it generally cleaned up the initial code by 50%. So some of that was to do with, you know, not doing it quite as correct as it should, but a lot of it was to cut out that bloat that, oh, down the road, we're gonna have to handle this. And it's like, yeah, we're not handling it here or what would ever happen if we had to plug the old system into this? It's like, we are not, and that's not part of our scope. So get rid of it. So it cleaned up, I'd say about 50% of the code in any, design review, as opposed to a PR, which is a change of code. This is kind of a generating. That's not to say we didn't leave it extensible. You do have an eye to the future, but you don't bill for it now because it probably will change anywhere between now and when you get to do it. Uh, every conceivable unlikely problem was not addressed. Uh, nuclear hits to the data center, uh, cosmic rays flipping bits uh, was not addressed. We just had provisioning, it was cutthroat, just keep to the scope of the project. So if iteration again is the key, how are we gonna iterate? Because we're now creating code. Well, design reviews were always done by the group, not by one or two people who approve each other's code reviews and it's kind of a handshake agreement. So the group got in. Uh, code reviews had to be done by at least two people. And by that, I mean one person submitted and two, uh, checked off the work. And we also did something that to me seems common sense, but I don't see used a lot, is that reviews were prioritized over new work. In other words, finish what you started and stop starting new stuff until that's done. So reviews were prioritized over new work, can be a bit of a cultural change because people don't like looking at other people's code and reviewing it. They'd much rather be writing their own. Unit tests, as I said, were a must for code acceptance. Any enhancement required a unit test. Any new process required a suite of unit tests. And they were looked at carefully to see if we were catching you know, all the modes that were going on. The QA automation, even though it was an imposition, was actually a godsend because automation, this is something that should have been done on the... Uh, on the legacy system and actually went back and like uh, did the exact same thing on the legacy system. They automated a large chunk of the of the uh, testing. So that was just something that fed back. But we were again, able to limit scope creep, keep the code quality up. And we had to now look for observability. So what did I have in terms of observability? Well, I did have basic system health checking where, um, uh, you know, is the process up, right? But I did not have any telemetry on raising an alarm if the requests peaked over a certain time of latency, if the volumes went over a certain time. Uh, I will say in my defense, this was a number of years ago when telemetry was not, there wasn't an API, there wasn't something easy I can grab. These days there is. Uh, in my last uh, project, which was a rewrite, I made sure we had telemetry actually instrumented the, the whole system and actually helped uh, put in uh, some open telemetry. So do it use, there's a standard for open telemetry, seeing if we could move to that. So we're using an open system of telemetry. So I'm a big fan of it nowadays, but back then uh, it was, you know, seen as uh, it's not really available. And it's, um, you know, people thought it was a waste of time. And then moving the functions by functionality, not by entity. Well, due to data analysis, uh, you know, large clients, we targeted them, right? Uh, now, that's not to say we went straight to a large client. We didn't. We said to the large clients, uh, we're coming, but we would need to use smaller clients first. So we have these kind of, I guess you call canaries, right? Where you bring them into the coal mine and see how they do. So they were checked first and seemed to be successful and then we could schedule the large clients being moved over. Now, after eight months approximately of work, and like I said, this thing had stalled. I remember prior to this, this thing had been started one and a half years beforehand and had stalled that and was making virtually no progress. So after eight months of structured work, we had a successful code rollout to production, but no clients were sent, had the trade sent our way because we had a dependency on another team. 
So we are think of it as we are a sink of data, right? Someone has to send stuff to us. We're not we don't generate it, and that needed some relatively modest changes. I would say about two to three days work in a in a sister team, and they just thought you know did not feel like doing it. Said they were very busy with their own work, which I can understand. So what do you do? Well, if you don't have visibility and you don't have market buy-in, there's not really much you can do. But as luck would have it, and it's a strange kind of luck, the wait times in those eight months had increased, I think, up to about 40 minutes or even longer. So where before it was like there's a system in development that kept people you know, at bay, this caused people to scream. And the largest client of them all made a direct complaint to senior management, and I mean senior. And that just came down as, why is this problem still available? You know, I'm saying, look, I got a system here. It's ready to rock. Um, send the trades my way. And that just sent the, the resource fountain, as I say, opened up. So that other uh, group very, very adroitly turned on the spigot, made the changes that were needed, and trade started flowing. So what was the upshot of all this? Well, congratulatory, congratulatory email sent out. This is great. You know, people on the team were named, uh, went out far and wide. The wait time had dropped, right, from 40 minutes to under a minute. The clients were ecstatic about it, uh, and as was I, as, you know, a successful rollout is, is not guaranteed. But if you remember, I had partitioned off the OMS trades and say, I'll pick them up in the next iteration. So is that a false promise? No, they were picked up in the very next iteration and they fall through They fall through that system now. And again, that system is very, very happy. All the lags are gone. So, you know, it's a sort of happy ending. However, I did not put any observability in. I did not put metrics. I do not have watermarks telling me how much my my system is is uh, is under pressure. Are, are we close to hitting a brink or something? Um, years later, it's still running. I reached back to the uh, the technical lead who owns that product, and I asked him about it. And he, you know, his response was, um, "Yeah, I mean, we don't really do much with it because it's a well-behaved system. So, I mean, yeah, it's great." Uh, we touch it only occasionally. So does it now need a rewrite? I don't know, maybe not. I would certainly be more, um, you know, confident in saying that if I said, you know what, the latencies these days never crest above, I don't know, a minute and a half. And the volumes are, you know, X and we're able to handle that easy. So again, what are the keys? I'll just summarize to uh, redesign a legacy system. Key ingredients are having a definite measure of success, having the proper knowledge composition for the old system, analyzing the requirements is analyzing the data, how it flows through the current system, locate the problem, and then design your solution. Key to design, produce that design first, base it on the data gathering and the flow of information through your system, plug in implementation technologies later. Underlying technology replacement is usually not the answer. If I have time, I will tell you where I have a project where it is the answer, but it's generally not the answer. And then the key to charting the progress, the key to be able to tell people, are you on track? The key to be able to give a long range forecast and say, hey, three months from now, I won't be delivering, as opposed to tomorrow I won't be delivering, is to have deliverables, milestones, and tasks where the resolution goes down to about a couple of days or a week. I keep them short because that's your resolution on how your timeline is set up. Move forward with iterative adaptive improvements, and that means adapt your design, but struggle to adhere to the goals and their overall vision. Real world will put pressure on you to hack your design, resist it. When you have a terminal mismatch, you need to be flexible and evolve. Now, that can be seen as you need some experience or you need to have some, it's a judgment call, and that's true. And hopefully you have some seasoned people in there that you can at least ask these questions of. Delivering the product is iteration, identify and shorten the feedback loops, code quality, have your unit testing, system testing, make sure you push the tests. 
as far down so that they're the shortest loop possible to keep that productivity up. Um, it, one other thing that can kill your productivity is where you're iterating where you're getting information from a loop uh, in the loop from someone in a different time zone. So a team in London is giving me in New York, hey, I have a problem. And I go, that's not a good definition. So they, those kind of loops are, are, are terrible to, to work with. So keep them short. Uh, to know how this thing, once you push it out, how it's doing and how it will continue to do, have meaningful metrics and alarms on those metrics. Do not rely on someone going in at four o'clock every day and taking a look because it just won't happen. Over time, it'll drop away. And when you're doing a successful rollout, move new users by functionality, not by entity, because you're going to pull the large multi-metric clients over sooner. And in fact, in one of the previous projects, we ended up taking clients and putting them into logical work clients. So there are groups within a company that do all the simple trades. And there's another group that does all the very hard ones that we don't have in scope. So we move that logical client over and leave that other logical client behind the user, but it's a way of pulling large volumes over. And once you have a large volume going through your system, you are verified as someone who is delivering product and you will get a lot of political goodwill capital, whatever you want to call it, to go ahead and do more of the conversion and bring the trickier stuff across. Okay. And again, a key intangible. So, what is the key intangible? And I say there is a certain amount of luck involved. In my case, it was the, the client complaining just at the right time. Um, you know, luck is something I would rely as little as possible on. There will be little pieces of it that show up here and there. But the whole idea of these guidelines or these keys is to prevent you having to rely too much on luck because that's your luck bucket will run out at some stage. And that's it. Um, I hope that wasn't too bad as far as time goes, about an hour and a half. But I'll take questions now. Well, first of all, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I found it very interesting. Um, no time-wise, it's not too bad. Usually, like, 30 minutes is the max we let people, like, go over. But that's the difference to, like, conference. We have no one scheduled after you, so it's uh, we're a bit more flexible. Well, I had to lean um, a bit on that flexibility, so thank you. Don't worry, no worries. Uh, there are two questions, and I think there are more questions, but they will be uh, like discussed in the after talk. Right? They're more suited for this scenario. So there's two questions that came up. One on slide 28. Um, what's going on with the brackets and parentheses? Do they mean anything? Yeah. Um, it's like 20. I don't know how to produce the name. Xadil Lakal, I'm not sure. Ask this question. So I have um, slide 27. And slide 29, so I don't have a 28. No, 28. 28, I think. There is no 28. Oh, okay. Well, then it, I'm not sure. It's a sure hidden slide from the expanded talk. So. Okay. Well, the, maybe there's something on, like, maybe the, the next slide. Can you show me the next slide? Maybe they missed it by one or so. 29. So this was about trade composition. Hmm. Okay, maybe wh whoever asked this question, please come in after talk chat and ask directly. I, we're kind of lost with the question. We don't know how to answer it. Um, the next one is uh, by Twitch SDR on slide 40. How do you keep track of open points that you need to fix later? Uh, so I would do that with scrums and sprints. All right. So an item is put on the backlog and pushed back into the backlog for later and gets prioritized. Um, so to me, though, limiting the scope and it becomes, again, a bit of a judgment call. So I can say this thing is really a phase two or a phase three item. OK, but we want to capture that now. OK, fair enough. It gets tagged with a label phase two and put in the backlog. right? And then it, it can't be forgotten about. Someone has to go and either ignore it or delete it. What would you say how big your backlogs were usually when working on this project, for example? I know my backlog didn't get too big because of the scope was so tightly defined in that particular project. But in other projects I've been on, the, you have to do a kind of um, a clean out of your backlog every so often because you'll find stuff that's vague, stuff that's no longer in date, stuff that just clutters up what is what is still a going concern. So I think after, after a particular length of time, 
you can make the case for throwing out stuff out of your backlog. And I think you should trim it every so often. So, you know, the where you go and do a uh, sprint planning or backlog or review, something like that should clean down your, your, your backlog items. Okay. I think maybe let me check one more time if there's some new questions that cropped up that are good to ask directly. Um, maybe let's do one last question by uh, Roy on slide 45. He asks, uh, typically when you realize a legacy system needs a redesign, what is usually the reason that the original design was chosen in the first place? So, um, typically when you require legacy, what is, you, what is the usual reason I was chosen in the first place? So the original design was chosen, be, uh, you know, a lots of times because you had to have something there to satisfy some business functionality or requirement, right? Mm -hmm. Some kind of product is needed to do X and it's, it's written. Lots of times, especially in the early days, if it's a long time legacy system, it starts off as a single process. Right, because you're putting sort of lower volumes through it, then you find that, you know what, this huge process becomes very unwieldy. You're going to split it out into logical pieces and they become tasks themselves, right? Or these days when you split it into threading, right? So it goes into different threading pieces. Um, and the thing will design itself organically as new functionality is needed. It has to meld with the old functionality. Uh, maybe you're in older technology. You don't have some of the, uh, you know, some of the expertise we have nowadays on what makes a good concurrent system. And over time, it organically grows. And also, we had no testing. Well, we got on fine with no tests. You didn't get on fine with no tests. What happened was your clients complained and submitted tickets over the last 30 years that made your system perform properly. That's like uh, water smoothing out a stone, right? Over time, uh, you have a stone in a river it becomes rounded and smooth just from the action. And the action of your users over a long time will give you a system that at least will perform what they're looking to do. It may not be reliable, and it certainly will be risky introducing any kind of large style change, which is why there is a lot of resistance in legacy systems for bringing in any kind of fundamental change because the, the testing isn't there to support it. So the risk is huge. And you have a large user base that's that's relying on this. So if you turn around and say, I'm going to replace a whole layer down here and we don't have testing, but I'm sure I'll be good at it. Uh, business will generally balk at that, as will the management chain. Yeah, I think that covers it. So well, we, are, we were very happy to have you here. It was a wonderful evening. And to everyone that's, uh, that's still watching, we have a uh, after, after talk chat. We post a Zoom link in the chat in a moment. We go, I think we'll show it also later. And yeah, that's it. That, that's I'll, be, I'll be joining that for probably 20 minutes or so, up to 3 o'clock. So if people want to ask me some more questions where it's more of a conversation or whatever, uh, feel free to jump on the Zoom call, call and hit me up. Other than that, uh, go out there and deliver uh, structured, structured programs and applications with low uh, tech debt and successful outcomes. <laughs>